are you teaching currently? I uh, I teach in the fall. Oh right. Um, at, well, when are at we? the GSD. Okay. So right now I'm not. Um, I actually have the luxury of uh, occasionally zooming into Marion's studio, so uh, I can still kind of uh, keep my hands in in some sort of uh, academic milieu uh, in the spring. But the both of you have been teaching off and on, or pretty consistently throughout your careers. It seems like. Yeah, I think teaching's always been embedded in what we have been doing as as architects and um, as folks who are, you know, still very interested in the kind of intersection between the academic uh, set of inquiries and the professional set of inquiries. I think often, mm -hmm. this is subject to a long conversation, <laughs> but I think often those two worlds are bifurcated in uh, rather unhealthy ways. So um, I think to the extent that we can continue to to teach and continue to practice and do both simultaneously, that's probably the healthiest thing. We have gotten busy, so you mm -hmm. know it's a little harder to be as engaged in teaching as we used to be. Um, and certainly for me, teaching one semester and even in a very focused way is probably uh, uh, just the right balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let's get into that. You know, uh, we can always Tarantino and go backwards and then hear your, your upbringing after the teaching part. So uh, you mentioned that in your mind, sometimes uh, the academic world and professional worlds are bifurcated. Uh, in what way? Well, I think, you know, there's a tendency um, and part of it is the kind of structure of academia to uh, very heavily engage um a faculty member in all the kind of protocols and all the sort of administrative challenges of uh, of being in the academic world. A lot of committees, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of work that goes beyond the purely uh, research-driven or teaching-driven. So there's a certain point where I think it's also just a function of time and where you allocate your resources. And even as a young architect or a young faculty member, um, you know, time is a precious commodity. So I think a lot of it depends on um, how you can allocate time. And when you're starting out in practice, there's also um, a very significant um, commitment to the sort of logistics of starting a practice. You know, mm -hmm. you, you design a building, you design an exhibition, but you also design the process, you design the structure of the studio, just as you do in an academic world. So I think um, the, the challenges, I think, are... Um, fairly extensive from both the academic demands, but also from the professional demands. And I think as our world becomes more institutionalized, mm. those demands tend to increase. So they kind of make it a little bit tough to do both. Of course, the great advantage of both is that, you know, what comes out of the sort of uh, the more immediate, the, the, the kind of more idiosyncratic uh, approach to research in an academic institution always, uh, I think, certainly for us, but I suspect this is true for many design architects or design-driven architects, uh, always feeds back to the professional work you're doing. Right. And um, similarly, I think our studio, our professional studio, is uh, still a, a, a young place where we have lots of um, recent graduates uh, former students. And so the kind of um, ability to think about our professional practice as an extension of the academic world is something we try to try to balance. So um, I think to answer your question in a very long-winded way, I think institutionally our society, I think, tends to silo mm -hmm. um, endeavors, whether they're academic endeavors or professional endeavors, and layers those endeavors with lots of extraneous and administrative baggage. Right. And as a result, it's hard to kind of juggle both. And I think it's also, there's a sort of general still, uh, which of course I think we're all fighting, a general atomization uh, in society, uh, either by discipline mm -hmm. um, or by experience. Uh, you know, you tend to be put in categories. Um, yeah. Michael and Marion are architects, but they also do landscape. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, yeah, do they yeah. do landscape as architects, or are they doing architecture as uh, landscape architects? So, you know, there's always a sort of need to kind of make a very simple soundbite 
mm-hmm. for what you do. And this is, I think, true in all the arts, um, whether you're a filmmaker, a, uh, a painter, sculptor, musician, uh, there's a sort of tendency, and certainly in science, of course, that comes with the territory, a sort of tendency to kind of silo activities. Wow, there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. Um, you know, you had mentioned that one of the struggles with teaching and with having a practice uh, is, is especially at the beginning when you're starting your practice. Uh, but when you guys started your office as a result of the, the competition that we spoke with Marion about, uh, were you teaching at that time as well? Yeah, yeah, oh. yep, I was. And um, um, I was teaching, uh, I, I had just finished teaching um, two places. Uh, one was the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies. Is that, a new, that, is that in New York? I, yeah, yeah. That was the, the famous um, kind of a think tank set up by uh, originally by Peter Eisenman. Huh. Um, so it was a very um, fertile and very intense uh, place. That was actually my, my very first teaching opportunity. And I was still working. And um, as um, Marion probably shared, we both, you know, were kind of jumping into these um, kind of pro bono. They weren't quite competitions, but, you know, they were all about sharing ideas. And um, I had just started um, teaching at uh, NYIT, New York Institute of Technology, Mm -hmm. when we won the competition. It was pretty clear that I couldn't do a daytime job and teach and start a practice. So um, Mary and I kind of uh, divvied things up. She taught at the University of Maryland. I taught at New York Institute of Technology and then um, really focused on getting that project going and using that project as a as a kind of catalyst to start our practice. I have to say, pretty often I tell Marina, I ask her, I don't know how anyone would do this on their own, like as a sole individual. I mean, kudos to all the people that do it. A lot of architects do, and a lot of them do that and they don't teach. But even then, you know, there's so many things to consider when you're starting a practice and then also trying to teach that I just don't get how you do it by yourself. I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, maybe some people do it um, by themselves. They might have help that, you know, they're not quite willing to uh, give credit uh, for mm. or a, a very able assistant. It's really hard. I think the thing that, that you guys probably are finding and that Mary and I certainly continue to find is that, you know, starting a practice or even continuing a practice has ups and downs and you need to have a lot of courage uh, to start something new. And it really helps to have someone um, kind of give you that courage and then for you to give them that courage because as you hand off various tasks and various um, challenges uh, with starting anything new, any new venture, um, but particularly a practice, you need to stay so optimistic and so, I think, in a way, almost naive to all of the sort of things that could um, become insurmountable obstacles. And um, having um, a partner by your side who um, you both see eye to eye on, for us, is really um, important and, um, you know, continues to give us courage when we're trying to push projects in directions that we hadn't um, or trying to kind of even frame studio briefs. Um, Mm -hmm. If I'm teaching, Marion's always engaged in framing something. If she's teaching, um, I uh, always love being able to um, respond to questions she might have or challenges that she's undertaking. So having a partner by your side, a true partner, um, I think is psychologically (laughs) and physically and intellectually really crucial. That's a great way to put it. I like the the courage part. I think that's true. And there's also a little bit of good guy, bad guy. Good what's a good cop, bad cop? <laughs> like yeah, happens. who's the yeah. who's yeah. the bad cop? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the bad cop. Well, uh, Marina, it's interesting because we often trade off. Nobody wants to be the bad cop, right? <laughs> it's always easier to be the good cop. So we we try to uh, make a deal where we trade off uh, who gets to be the bad cop. But you know, I think it works. Um, well, I'll say the question for when we get to the practice. Um, but going back to teaching, 
Um, you know, you had mentioned the different requirements, uh, all the administrative ones and uh, research, and that is more for sure a requirement when you're full-time faculty. I've only taught part-time, so I don't have those other loads put on top of me. Um, but are you, are you, well, you're, you only teach in the spring, but are you still required to do research? Because I know for some schools, the research portion is, you know, just as significant, if not more important as to whether or not you stay hired and who they're looking for to be uh, faculty. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, we always in our teaching try to embed a research component to the studio itself. So uh, whether it's a series of case studies or a series of seminar readings, um, there is a bit of research. And I think in our respective academic institutions, because we're now at a point where, you know, we, we have had a pretty significant number of projects, we're able to, I think, um, use those projects, past, present, and future, to uh, talk to students about the research that we're doing mm -hmm. in the context of practice. So we, we take what is, um, what in another field like physics would be pure research and um, think about it in terms of architectural research, applied research. So the history of a particular site, the ecological um, agendas that come out of a particular site that we might be teaching in the context of a studio um, is always embedded in the uh, in the studio effort as uh, real research. So mm -hmm. we might bring in an ecologist, we might bring in a planner, we might bring in um, a an engineer, so that students also understand that architecture does require a certain uh, kind of research. And that research may be a little different from the pure research that a, a chemist or a physicist might do, but we do research. So we try in uh, shaping studios to identify um, and, and call that out as research, because I think it's very important um, both as practicing architects, but also as educators the students understand that there is a component of research to architecture. Right. I think that's interesting. And I, it seems like a very productive way to address the schism between academia and uh, practice. Right. Yeah. So because a lot of times research in schools by faculty, it's pure research and it tends to be uh, not 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 valuable. I'm not saying that, but it's sometimes pretty esoteric and not really relevant to anything that's happening and anything that's being built. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think you're right. And I think that's subject probably to another <laughs> conversation is that, you know, how to, how to kind of redirect that research toward um, fruitful ends. Mm. Um, you know, part of it too is that um, many, many years ago, I, you know, was really focused on a seminar in urban design, uh, just as Marion was also focused on a seminar on drawing. So, in the context of doing a seminar, you're doing real research. Um, I think now um, I'm at Harvard mostly because I also practice and practice is a form of research. So I, I think the school recognizes that in order to bring in um, practicing architects who operate at an urban scale, that in a way, their practice is in a way research. And similarly, um, Marion is uh, a professor of practice, so the idea is that they wouldn't expect either of us uh, in our respective institutions or institutions in general to conduct pure research. I think there's a greater value placed on the research we do in practice mm -hmm. than the research we do uh, purely as academics. So we've been fortunate in so far as uh, we've reached a point where um, the work that we're doing professionally um, has a sort of reciprocity in the context of studios. And I think that's, um, you know, why we continue to teach is that, um, you know, we firmly believe that um, a productive and relevant practice is engaged in areas and questions that are extraordinarily relevant at so many different levels, whether they're social, cultural, or environmental, mm -hmm. and having them feed back into 
uh, a kind of studio environment is something that we can bring that uh, a pure researcher who might be studying environmental issues from a purely academic point of view can't bring. So mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of convergence of what we bring to an academic setting and what uh, a, a researcher who is, uh, you know, purely invested in the academic setting, um, what together we can kind of bring to a, a curriculum uh, about architecture, which is, of course, a, you know, an applied art. It's not a pure art, nor is it a pure science. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think that is probably the ideal scenario. It sounds like a dream setup to have. And part of my interest in this topic is that we've seen and see a lot of architects um, who teach at the same time, and I get the distinct impression, and I've heard from some of them actually, that they admit that teaching was, in their case, ended up being too much of a distraction, and they felt, you know, this is why my practice didn't get to where it could have gone, because I put too much time into the uh, studio, the, st the school studio, <clears throat> you know. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, I think for a lot of teachers too, it's, it's kind of, um, it's this passion and it's, you want to sink all your effort into it to make sure the students get what they deserve, but, uh, not easy. It takes time. It, it does. And I think, um, I mean, that's, uh, I think a very real condition. And I think, um, we are, I think, uh, fortunate and I feel very fortunate to be able to invest a little more time in the practice than mm -hmm. in the teaching. Um, but I would sort of say that however small the percentage of teaching is, it carries with it huge, huge benefits. And I, I hope also not only from a kind of a selfish uh, personal point of view, but also the engagement with students. We, mm. we stay engaged with our students, you know, um, in very fundamental ways. There are students who we are still in touch with that uh, we had in studio 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so it's kind of nice to have those sorts of formative bonds. And we have similarly treated our, our practice as a sort of very much a studio practice. So young architects who might have come here just for an internship or for a short period of time, it's been really nice to see them um, move on and either go into teaching uh, or start their own practices. So I think there is a sense of being an educator, even in the context of practice. I was wondering in the studio, <clears throat> in the in the academic studio, is there ever a concern that you're, I don't know, somehow showing too much of your own work? And I guess what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, some professors, they are really heavy and into showing their work and having students understand how, how they work and their process and their form of architecture, style of architecture, approach to architecture. And others are like, I don't want to show you any of my stuff, even though it's all out there, it's online, you've probably read my work. I don't really want to talk about that because it's it's going to be, it's going to lead to students maybe just kind of following the steps that I seem to be putting in place or following what I've done before. And I don't want you to, I want you to think on your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think we're, you know, always thinking about that. I think what we try to impress on students is a way of thinking, uh, a way of thinking that, you know, comes natural to us or a way of thinking that we've developed over time, a way of kind of researching projects prior to jumping in. Um, and we try to get students not to look at our work in terms of a, a kind of a stylistic reference. And it's hard because you know, images are out there. Students know who you are. They know your work. They, you know, are excited about taking your studio. They're excited about having your um, your criticism uh, directed toward their projects. And um, so it's hard to kind of disentangle the work you do from what they look at mm -hmm. and, you know, want to absorb. So we really work hard in you know, trying to kind of... Um, um, disentangle what the work looks like from what we think is much more critical in an academic setting is how we think about generating the work. Mm -hmm. And then we try to, you know, structure studios so that um, the kind of issue of form and the issue of, of how something looks 
comes after students have looked at other projects, after they look carefully at ecological and social issues, mm-hmm. cultural issues related to a site. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, well, if it's helpful, we share how our projects came into being, but always with the intention of shaping the why rather than um, the how. <laughs> That's great. The, the why, the how, and the what are three words I use in this podcast way too often, but yeah, I think well, it's, uh, it's great. Good, good. I'm comfortable with, uh, we'll get to the what later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> so talking about the how, um, how, how did you get into teaching? Uh, was that a, a calling for you from, you know, an earlier age or did it kind of an opportunity happen and, and it's been lasting that long? What, how did yeah. it start? Yeah, that's a good, uh, great question. You know, things always kind of happen a little bit by surprise. Um, I uh, I went to Cornell, and um, they were very, very generous, uh, both in terms of uh, supporting the costs of a graduate degree there, but also gave me an opportunity to be a teaching assistant. So, um, in a way, I backed into that, uh, Marina. I, you know, had n- never thought about actively wanting um uh, a full-time teaching job, but what was really nice is it gave me a little bit of a flavor for what it was like to interact with students and to use the kind of teaching as a way of also uh, teaching myself, because uh, mm-hmm. I think one of the great values of engaging an academic studio, if you're a practitioner and if you're serious about it, is it, it there's a reciprocity, it, it sort of feeds back to your own work and you can use it as a way of testing ideas. So uh, very early on when I was in graduate school, I had a chance to to teach and it was a a remarkable experience for me. And then I found that I liked it and uh, even when I was uh, working in an office, uh, tried to find a few opportunities to teach. Nice. And it seemed like most of the courses you've taught, or a fair amount, were focused not just at the building scale, but more at the urban scale? Yeah, and I think that that sort of was by intention. Um, You know, when I went to Cornell, I I studied with Colin Rowe, and Hmm. it was ostensibly an urban design studio, but, you know, calling it that would be uh, too limiting. It was all you know, it was all over the place. I mean, it was all about the history of architecture, the theory of architecture, how architecture related to a larger kind of societal uh, agenda. And I I think that really sharpened my interests in seeing architecture in in a more more, uh, expansive setting or placing architecture in a more expansive terrain. Wait, so was Colin Rowe your studio teacher or was it like a seminar class? No, no, he was he was actually teaching studio. Oh, uh, wow. You could listen in on his uh, seminars. And at Cornell at the time, there were two major figures, um, Colin Rowe, and he would always take maybe 10 to 12 students. Uh, so it was very small, very much of a kind of, you know, a hothouse. Um, the other great teacher there at the time was German architect um, O.M. Ungers. Hmm. And... Um, uh, O.M. was also, you know, just starting to kind of get his practice going in um, in Germany and, and doing a number of projects in Berlin. So it was a very exciting time to be um, at Cornell as a student and seeing these two great teachers and being able to uh, teach some uh, uh early uh, introductory courses to architecture and and being able to to be a teaching assistant. So it was really pretty fantastic um, to think of, uh, of architecture as, as having a kind of a a more expansive agenda. Right. So is your bachelor's in architecture? My, my bachelor's is in architecture. I went to Notre Dame. We'll kind of work our way backwards. (laughs) And then, um, um, won a uh, traveling, um, fellowship, the Paris Prize, and traveled around uh, North Africa, mm. Europe, southern Spain, uh, all the way up into Finland, um, and spent a year kind of knocking about, and then decided that I was really stimulated by that experience and really wanted to go to graduate school. And um, I looked around uh, in various places, and I 
wanted a, a, a setting where I could really immerse myself and um, get close to some really interesting people, not be distracted with too many other things that, you know, might be happening in a large city. And Cornell at the time, Colin Rowe, and that particular moment at Cornell was was really ideal for me. Yeah. Uh, it was a kind of a an incubator. It was a sort of hothouse. You're kind of in Ithaca. And uh, you have a chance to study with a number of really interesting people, including, you know, uh, a master's class with, in this case, in my case, um, Colin Rowe. So it was, uh, I think, the perfect place for me at the perfect time. I mean, that's a great perspective to have, uh, you know, when you're approaching and you're selecting a graduate program and the idea of a school being in a place that's maybe a little less you know, crowded with a bunch of things going on can actually be you mean? distractions, <laughs> essentially, yeah. can actually be pretty productive. I mean, you know, there's a kind of balancing act between, let's say, solitude on the one hand as, as an extreme and then um, information coming in. But I, I do feel like there's something valuable about being in a place that's maybe a little bit quieter. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, I think it depends on the particular person. Some people go to graduate schools to kind of pick up a a second degree that has a certain gravitas. Uh, there are others who might, you know, have gone to an undergraduate program in a very remote, quiet place and then want, you know, the sort of stimulus of a big city. For me, having, you know, um, been comfortable in fairly uh, dense, lively urban settings and having spent a year traveling around, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was really great. And the other thing that kind of happened that I didn't quite, um, think of at the time was the sort of interaction with my fellow students and um, something that Mary and I both share um, the graduate landscape studio was right next to the uh, architecture and urban design studio that I was in so that was a sort of very interesting bit of serendipity because it you know kind of really cemented uh, a kind of growing interest that had been nascent from mm -hmm. Many, many years. I was just going to ask, actually, um, so your interest in urban issues, did that first really crystallize and become more serious to you during grad school as a result of studying under Colin Rowe and then being adjacent to the urban urban schools or whatever you mentioned? Um, you know, in hindsight, and what we can spend a little bit of time talking about background, I grew up in Rome, and mm. um, one of the things that was really um, lucky for me at the time was, you know, my mom was absolutely um, maniacal about taking me around to various churches, uh, ruins, uh, buildings, but they were always seen in context and they were always seen as part of a kind of urban fabric. So mm. to a certain degree, you know, when I was 12, I didn't think about architecture and urbanism and I didn't think about urban theory. But <laughs> later, yeah. you know, after... Um, you know, deciding uh, that I wanted to go to graduate school, I think all of these things tended to coalesce and come to the surface, they bubble up to the surface. So you realize, you know, what you might have intuited, uh, you know, 10, 15 years earlier when you were younger suddenly becomes very apparent. So uh, I would sort of say when I got to Cornell, what was interesting is that, you know, it was an architecture and urban design program. There was, as I said, I, I hadn't intended on this being important, but there was a landscape program going on. And um, um, Matthias Ungers was also doing a whole series of studies on the city mm. um, and uh, typological uh, studies around certain types, urban types, uh, certain architectural types, like typologies. So it was really, a, I think, a, a kind of a constellation of different forces, different ideas that coalesced at the right time for me. Right. I, I mean, I think, you know, I've always had this, uh, my master's is in urban design. Um, yeah. And my bachelor's is in architecture. So maybe it's obvious as to why I'm saying that. But uh, I've always kind of felt that the progression from architecture at a smaller scale to thinking at a bigger scale is almost natural. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing a building, then you get to the exterior of the building, and then you have to consider what's responding to and then there's no limits to that kind of progression of thought. You keep going and going and going until you reach the edge of the city. <laughs> and then you're like, what? Wait, I should just design cities, <laughs> you know? Yep, yep. Well, I think that is a natural progression. I think you also start to realize that, you know, um, 
the kind of reciprocity between different scales is actually really interesting. It's mm. very stimulating. It's very liberating. And, um, you know, um, if architecture is to be meaningful, it's always rubbing up against other uh, disciplines as well. And um, so, uh, like you, I think the kind of shift in scale um, was very, very productive uh, for me. And, and it also, I think, uh, was liberating, too, because then you go back down to an architectural scale, um, I think, enriched by the process of thinking about larger contexts. Yeah. It's weird how that works. And I have those moments pretty often um, where, you know, we're, if, let's say at the smallest, we're looking at the the interior of like a bedroom, a master bedroom or something, or primary suite, we should say. Um, you know, this it's odd. There's some kind of principles at play in, in, in that scale, which are the same thing as being applied to thinking at the biggest scale, let's say, of a city. I mean, obviously, there are nuances and subtleties that are completely different, but there are things that are similar. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, I think it, it may be a cliche, but you can design a house like a city, right? And mm. uh, think of, uh, you know, its its streets, its uh, gathering places, uh, its places of quiet um, in the context of, uh, of a tiny little house, um, just as, you know, you can kind of flip it and reverse that kind of analogy. So then going all the way back, Back to the beginning. <laughs> so you're you're in New York City. You've been there for for some time. You've been in the United States for some time. But you are from you were born in Italy and raised in Rome, as you said. I've never been to Rome, but I'm curious. You know, how long were you there before you came to the United States, and what was it like uh, seeing yeah. all the cathedrals and the places that your mom took you to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good question, and I, I think one of the nice things about a conversation like this is it kind of forces you to think about antecedents and um, <laughs> personal histories. Um, I, I was actually born in Trieste, which is a very interesting city in northeastern Italy. But we moved to Rome when I was about two and stayed there till I was almost 15. Um, my my mom, uh, you know, we, we spoke English at home, and um, but uh, got out a lot. And um, I, I think in hindsight, you know, the sort of places that my mom would take me to were things that I didn't think about at the time as being, you know, overtly architectural. So in hindsight, you know, uh, going to a place like the Villa Giulia, which is an Etruscan museum, and I was fascinated with all the swords and things like that, that, you know, a young boy might, um, and the statues and things like that. But it was also, I realized, an amazing villa where the kind of exchange between inside and outside is very carefully crafted. It's actually designed by the architect Vignola, who also did very beautiful garden designs. Hmm. Um, so another you know, favorite is the Villa Lante, uh, which is a garden design. Um, it's all about engaging the landscape. Um, so very formative early, I suppose, exposures. Um, led me, I think, to develop this sort of deep-seated uh, interest in thinking about architecture as a kind of larger endeavor. And it was fun. As a, as a little kid, you, you know, you would go around and, um, you know, um, I think now uh, this time of year, um, the Spanish Steps, which are this kind of beautiful hybrid infrastructural project, is it architecture, is it landscape, or is it urban design, are covered with thousands of azaleas. Um, mm -hmm. So it becomes this sort of very surreal um, ascending garden. And um, again, all these kind of memories still stay with me, and they kind of certainly came back in graduate school. So that, that kind of, uh, I think that the, the, the privilege of being in a, in a setting where architecture was always present, uh, you know, over many eras, it wasn't just a question mm -hmm. of... Um, Renaissance architecture, you, you know, you'd see the city alive. Um, it wasn't um, a sentimental approach to urbanism. You know, piazzas and streets were well used and very contemporarily used. Um, and just as there was also very contemporary architecture from the 50s and fantastic furniture design mm. coming out of Italy at that time. So I think it was a, a great place to grow up and a great place, I think, to be exposed uh, through, I think, um, the intensity of, of my parents being there. 
Gosh, I do miss living in a city now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, there's this yeah, intense well, community that happens there. The the flowers and the stairs, or whatever it is. There's events. There's there's community. Yeah, yeah, and there's surprises. I think yeah. the beauty of being in a city is that you're always surprised by either a physical um, performance that uh, happens and it's spontaneous, or by interacting with someone who you typically might not interact. Um, and I, you know, I suppose that's why. I always thought about going back to Rome, but um, Rome, in a way, you know, the, the the real kind of exciting adventures in architecture have been occurring in Milan now for, for several decades. And, you know, uh, Rome can be a, a beautiful, enchanting, but very parochial place. So I came to New York from Cornell with the idea of, you know, experimenting with New York and possibly going back to Rome, um, but decided that um, after a couple of years here, um, you know, I thought I'd give it a few more years, and then, you know, four <laughs> years turned into eight, eight <laughs> into 12, and then Mary and I started a practice, so it was really um, inevitable. But I think I've always been drawn to cities, and New York, I think, has some of the intensity that, um, you know, I really... Uh, got as a kid in Rome, um, different, of course, um, different climate, different setting, different culture. But the idea of being in this kind of urban setting has always, I think, been something that has been um, important to me. And I suspect, um, you know, um, for Marion, too, being in New York is something that she feels much more comfortable with than not. Mm. So then you have to decide which which college and which major to go to um, when you are younger, right? How did you how did you come about deciding to start architecture? So a uh, great question, and there's a, a funny story that I will tell you. Um, there was a uh, an architect named Carlo Pelliccia who uh, did beautiful industrial design, and um, his um, fiance was a woman who was probably all of 21 years old, but um, <laughs> to a 14 year old, she was the epitome of what a beautiful woman would be like. And he was a very handsome architect and they were engaged to each other. And <laughs> like, like me, uh, he had a, uh, a sketch pad and I, I love to draw. Um, and I thought, Oh my gosh, he, he, he's doing these uh, fantastic projects. He's, drawing and he has uh, a beautiful incredibly intelligent um uh woman to whom he's engaged to i i, I definitely want to become an architect <laughs> <laughs> and um the woman's uh name of course was lola uh, which is a very <laughs> sexy, beautiful name yeah and lola was a, a fantastic linguist um she could speak multiple languages fluently um so i you know through a a uh pre-adolescent uh, infatuation, I realized that architecture was a profession. I, I knew about architecture, I knew about buildings, I knew about drawings, but I never thought of what architecture as a, as a profession would be like. And the amazing bit of serendipity is that many years later, when my father returned to the States, he um, helped get Lola a uh, uh, a job at the University of Virginia, uh, where she became uh, the chair of the Italian department. Oh. And, and Carlo Pelliccia became a much-loved professor at the School of Architecture. And um, when I was talking to Marion early on in our practice, uh, uh, we both were saying, well, you know, who influenced you? Uh, who, who was a major figure? And I described this story of um, Carlo Pelliccia and um, unbelievable serendipity. Carlo was a very influential uh, professor, much older at the time, but for her, one of the kind of um, seminal um, uh, professors that uh, encouraged her to, to go into architecture. Oh, wow. wow. That's amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing story, yeah, right? Great. It's quite unbelievable. Do you still visit Italy often? I mean, uh... yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I mean, the sad part for me now is that um, th there's no one there that I'm mm. 
you know, related to or very close to a, some, uh, a woman who helped uh, raise me, um, who passed away a couple of years ago. Um, my very best friend is now in Geneva. And um, so, I've, you know, going back there is different. It, you know, when you don't have family in a particular place anymore, you feel a little bit uh, of an orphan. <laughs> um, but it's always worth going back and always, always a pleasure. Yeah. Have you guys ever considered trying and do a, a project in Italy? We, you know, we have, and um, a few times it sort of uh, just never went ahead. I mean, the economy has not been very good. Um, we did build a little pavilion um, for the Venice Biennale that was actually constructed um, in a small town, Pavia, outside of Venice. And um, uh, so um, I suppose, um, but, you, know, you, could, you could say that uh, we built a little structure um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> two years ago in Venice. Uh, it, it was this fantastic little pavilion as part of the Venice Biennale in um, the Arsenale, which is a very yeah. sort of cavernous, fantastic cavernous space that was used in the 15th century to build ships. Um, so the Venice Biennale is hosted there in this very, very large space. And we were one of a number of architects who were invited to uh, to show our work. And we used uh, the kind of creation of a pavilion to show that. So that that's our last Italian project. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. clearly uh, growing up in Italy had an influence, as, as you've mentioned, on uh, thinking more at the city scale and your love for cities. Uh, you know, you also commented um, uh, about I Italian design furniture being very successful and good, essentially. That's and we would agree best. with that. Whenever we look at furniture and it's a really nice piece, oh, it's, a <laughs> it's, it's Italian. About Italian. Um, so uh, what I guess my question is that, do you find that that your 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 roots there somehow also influence your work more? Uh, I suppose you could say it at a, in a sculptural way. You know, just the beauty of something, because there is definitely a quality that a lot of Italian designed industrial pieces, industrial design pieces have, as just super elegant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's actually a really good point. I hadn't thought of that directly, but I think one of the things that does stand out is uh, those pieces, um, as you say, are also, um, you know, using very uh, contemporary technologies. Um, mm. And I think to that extent, uh, that that is something that's important uh, in our work. Uh, we want it to kind of not only engage a context at multiple levels, but also to be overtly of its time. Mm. And um, so in that sense, you know, we're exper experimenting with glass. Uh, lately, we've been experimenting with brick. Um, and I think those industrial design pieces you're referring to um, are very beautifully crafted and experiments in blowing glass or in how chrome is bent, curved, um, new um, polymers. Um, there, there is a sort of appreciation for the elegance of design and the kind of convergence of design and new technologies that I think mm. um, probably, um, yeah, uh, probably uh, has been uh, pretty significant. You know, we were just talking about the other day, Marin and I, about um, this idea that a lot of the building components are highly standardized, uh, especially at the, when we're talking about projects that don't have a lot of money, <laughs> uh, they're highly standardized in that that when I think architects and designers make use of those components, a lot of times there is, they allow the a, a preconception of what the component is meant to be or how it's going to be used to dictate the design itself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is different, which is very different, obviously, from, you know, researching and rethinking, like, what is, what can glass do? What can glass be or, uh, or brick, as you mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, is it difficult to, to, you know, approach uh, materials and, and, and the way things are built with that kind of, uh, you know, desire for, for questioning things? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think it, it, this may sound somewhat evasive, but I think, you know, in, in making a building, whether it's a big building or a small building, you're always kind of toggling between um, 
where you want to experiment and where you want to take something conventional and flip it and turn it into something unconventional. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the, um, the kind of imaginative aspects of a project have to do with taking a conventional system and, and kind of turning it inside out, so to speak. There are other times when you kind of fundamentally want to rethink the particular material characteristics. So I, I'll give you one example. In our, our Barnard project, um, which is at Columbia University near the McKinley and White historic structures, which are all brick, the, um, the mandate and the kind of uh, ambition was to create a building that would be respectful of its neighbors, but be very much of its own time. And we, um, we, you know, we looked at brick, of course. Um, we looked at precasts that could be tinted, so it kind of had a, a kind of uh, brick-like chroma. And we kind of discovered that um, we really liked some glass that was um, color integral. And if we sandblasted that glass, it would have a very softness, um, a lot like beach glass has. You can't quite tell. You know, it has that that kind of very soft um, um, surface to it that makes it very unglass-like. And th we kept experimenting. And then we layered on the kind of idea of ceramic fritz uh, to that. So we ended up with a very novel approach to glass, which is, you know, not surprising an ancient material. Um, but then we decided that for reasons that had to do with budget and timing, the glass would be attached to a fairly conventional uh, curtain wall system. So we couldn't rethink the glass and the curtain wall system, nor, nor did we want to. I think, you know, yeah. part of the project had to be a little bit more normative, a little quieter, and the glass became the kind of primary mode of expression in terms of the building using glass to relate to a number of brick buildings in, in new and surprising ways. So that's a case of, of kind of pairing... Um, a set of innovative um, experiments, principally with glass, onto a, a kind of a, a support system that was somewhat conventional and tested. Was it difficult for you to get this uh, concept or this this idea uh, approved by the client or understood by the client? We we did. Um, <laughs> I mean, at first, it was kind of an accident. You know, sometimes you're in the studio, you pick up a material, and you kind of say, well, this looks really cool. What if we sandwich it with this? Or what if we try some with some simple tape, laying stripes and, and things? <laughs> right. And, um, what we did is we then presented it to the client. And I think what was really great is that the board of trustees were very interested in not having a traditional building. So that helped us. Mm-hmm. But we were able to show that by doing many, many different studies of the color of the brick buildings around uh, this building, and there were maybe you know 30 different shades of brick that went from bright red to a very, very dark brown, we were able to, um, in a way, uh, capture the best of both worlds, a building that was very much of its time and different, yet... Um, somewhat um, respectful of its neighbors. Um, and then the other thing that we did, since you know institutions sometimes are concerned about um, you know, the riskiness of a new material, uh, mm -hmm. that's also why we were able to say it could be um, mounted and installed with a fairly conventional system. Mm -hmm. And we, um, you know, the process was fairly slow, Marina, on that because we then, after sharing many renderings and small samples, we actually constructed several uh, mock-ups right in situ so you could see it with the particular color mm -hmm. of the surrounding buildings, the particular quality of light from morning to afternoon. So it was a very slow process. Um, and I think in some ways it also helped us because we were able to refine how... Right the glass would look and the different types of glass that we use there were, you know several several well, there were seven different panels with several combinations of different glasses um, arranged uh, over i think there were i think a thousand different panels so um, 
it was a slow but very thoughtful process. And that, I think, convinced uh, uh, the board, the people who are, you know, sort of helping to fund the project, that this would be really an interesting and very viable approach. Yeah, I was going to say that it, it must be it must be difficult to convert concept with just, I don't, I don't know, like 2D images or visualization when it's such about the feeling of the glass and the light and, and its condition when it's in place in mm -hmm. that specific location with that specific light. So, uh, yeah, I think you said something that uh, along the lines that the client wanted something different and maybe was more willing to maybe take some risk than, you know, some others wouldn't. And, and and I think that's super important because, like you said, this process needed mock-up and refinements and actually figuring out technically how it was going to be made. Um, and sometimes it's difficult because sometimes clients want to know exactly right away what it's going to look like for them to understand and decide yes or no, mm -hmm. let's move on with this idea or not. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're raising a very good point, which is designing the process by which you do something innovative is almost as important as the design itself. And so we uh, tried to explain how the process of looking first at smaller samples, then larger samples, then a full-scale mock-up would help everyone uh, feel like this was the right decision. And we try to do that as much as we can. And and some some clients are very sophisticated and receptive to the idea of mock-ups. Um, and some, I, I think, are less so. But I think, to your point, it's also an opportunity to kind of test out different different shapes. Um, you know, we always have mock-ups that have different choices because we know that how the quality of light in a particular setting um, affects a material or how a material reads or how you can capture shadows um, is very hard to simulate in right. the studio. Yeah. yeah. But why would a client be opposed to mock-ups? Just because of the time and cost involved? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, a full-scale mock-up could be, you know, uh, uh, extremely expensive, uh, you know. Um, yeah. uh, and also it's the time um, because, you know, the contractor has to build a mock-up that might be 10 feet by, you know, uh, 15 feet, you know, three by four or five meters. Um and that's a, you know, it's a pretty serious investment, both in terms of cost and time. My, I, I love mock-ups. They're me so too. interesting to me. And, and like, if someone should create a gallery of mock-ups. Like, just save all the mock-ups that, that are done. Oh, that would be awesome. Okay, that's my maybe, idea, though. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you should take this on, you guys, as a project and uh, collect a whole series of images of mock-ups for uh, interesting buildings and then kind of see how the mock-up in the building uh, stacked up. No, I mean, maybe just, we're onto something yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. They're just yeah. so much fun, you know. It's like all the all the goodness of the building is compacted into this one thing, and it's fresh, well, it's it, new. But it's an interesting part of the process, right? To be able to see a portion of the building before the building is done in yeah. like mm -hmm. a physical human one-to-one -one scale. I mean, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. We're very interested also um, in how how light moves across. A, a building or a landscape and how it changes the character. And I think we try very hard to make buildings that look one way in the early morning, but may look very different in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I think um, mock-ups are particularly important <laughs> for that because you can study them uh, or parts of a building under real conditions um, and the quality of light as it as it washes across a surface um, becomes really important. We we did a, a brick building at Kent um, for their uh, School of Environmental Design and it had a series of projecting brick, custom brick verticals so that from a distance the wall looked kind of almost corrugated. But we realized that we had to turn the building two degrees <laughs> Because it was essentially facing north, and and the the verticals weren't catching shadows like we hoped, and so we turned them about the building about two degrees, and then tested that in the mock-ups, and you know were able to demonstrate that by just shifting it, the early early morning light or the late afternoon light would cast these very strong shadows, and that was like, it sounds so simple and so obvious, but sometimes the most 
obvious thing is something you can't pick up until you see it in a mock-up. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and how would you know unless you were on site? I, I was going to ask, um, well, first, uh, two things. The name of the, the, the project at Barnard was the D Diana uh, Center? Or Diana something? Center, yeah. Okay. And the one with the brick that you just mentioned was called? Uh, Kent, Kent State um, College of uh, Architecture and Environmental Design. Okay. Just in case people want to look it up because both buildings yeah, are really Yeah, yeah. It's on our, on our website. Yeah. The Barnard building is, is it's amazing. pretty cool. It's yeah, pretty cool. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, do, are you guys able to make use uh, of visual, visualization tools um, to get you know more accurate uh, sun studies and shadow studies and things like this bef without doing a mock-up, or is it? Yeah, I, yeah, I you know I think there's no question that um, you know there's some amazingly um, sophisticated tools out there that we use, um, but you know we also use really simple tools. We'll make a, a, a small model, even if it's a one-to-one -one model out of uh, styrofoam and bring it, up, bring it up onto the roof just to kind of see. So we actually love pairing very low-tech approaches with very high-tech um, um, rendering and uh, simulation programs. And I think one of the things that we like that I think has changed a lot, particularly since you know we have a really strong interest, uh, as I mentioned, in how buildings change over the course of the day or over the course of the year, but also how you move through buildings, the sort of um, the cinematography of, uh, of the effect of moving through a building, the kind of promenade. And, I, you know, there's some great programs now that were just in their infancy when Mary and I um, started out that are very helpful and very sophisticated in terms of how to uh, you know, almost choreograph like a great director would um, how you move through a building and that those those programs along with simulating sunlight and stuff are really helpful. Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned this idea that uh, back when we were talking about uh, school versus the profession, you mentioned that there's kind of a specialization or an atomization of things uh, uh, applicable to that topic, but also just generally speaking. And I th and I would agree with that. I think that's true. Um, and you mentioned the idea that the architect is a generalist, or maybe I interpreted that. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that the work that you guys do is successful because it's you know consistently tackling uh, a number of different issues within each project, and you're not hyper focusing on one thing and excluding other issues, um, which I think some architects. Do do they focus on just mm. the sculpture of the thing, or probably other aspects as well? Is it more difficult today to operate as a generalist because of the the current situation that we're we're in and how things are structured? Or do you think you're, of yourselves as generalists? Uh, we do. I, I think we definitely see ourselves as generalists. I think it's both easier today and harder. I think it's harder because you know I think. Our, our world, and this is not just true for architecture, it's true for almost everything, is, you know, is extraordinarily specialized. Um, so, you know, the kind of, um, the mode toward increased specialization has been going on, you know, since the turn of the century. Hmm. Um, and it's been accelerated post-World War II. And it's particularly true in the sciences, um, but also in academia. You know, you do a doctoral on a very particular program and you become a specialist, whether it's French linguistic theory of the 1930s or, you know, uh, a particular part of a play of Shakespeare's, I think there's a tendency to uh, always go deep and narrow. It's easier now, um, on the other hand, I would say, because the kind of challenges that we're facing, the sort of environmental challenges, um, can't the solutions can't be relegated to a particular discipline. So they, they do require disciplinary thinking mm. that goes beyond just a, a, a particular discipline. So they're interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, um, however you want to describe it. The, the problems we're facing are, are huge mm. and they can't be solved. And I think the sciences are starting to recognize that too. I think, you know, the big tech companies have always been fascinated with how architecture studios are set up. So it's not surprising that 
Facebook, uh, went to Frank Gehry to see how his studio uh, was set up and tried to copy that. You know, oh, through, really? Obviously, Frank Gehry's work. Um, so I think as generalists now, architecture um, is increasingly relevant and has greater and greater agency. Um, you know, there's still disciplinary barriers, administrative barriers to that. But um, I think what we are starting to realize, and we're not alone, we're seeing this in the context of clients too, is that, um, you know, the, the world has gotten smaller, more complex, and more interrelated. So uh, those sort of interrelationships require um, a much broader thinking, a, a, a much broader general, generalized approach to problems rather than trying to tackle them through a very specific and narrow agenda. I think that's true. I think that's a great way to put it, too. I mean, there is definitely an awareness from the general population that a lot of these issues are mixed together and that it requires some kind of vision, uh, whether that come from the architect or whoever, but some kind of vision that's not just, you know, again, hyper-focused on their one thing because we recognize that that has bad consequences. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, ah, nuts, I lost my question again. <laughs> Sorry. Just signature move? That's my signature move, to lose the question every once every recording. Yeah, well, that's great. It kind of keeps me on my toes. <laughs> yeah, um, the other thing is that, you know, we've spoken to a lot of architects on this podcast, and, and one of the things that's come up is that construction quality and build quality and the cost of construction and... Uh, one of the people we spoke with recently was Stanley Sadowitz, a San Francisco architect, a modern architect. And he was saying that, you know, basically today, the, the, the projects I'm doing are the most expensive and the poorest quality because it, things just cost a lot more. And then, I don't know, the skill and material for whatever reason is, is not as good as it once used to be. Do you find that's the case with the type of projects that you guys do? You know, yes and no. I, I, you know, I think there's a tendency to want to say, well, you know, um, in the past, projects were of higher quality and um, therefore, you know, um, also cost less. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. I think, you know, you have to kind of look at it through a slightly finer kind of grain. It depends on the type of projects, depends on the kind of ambition, um, and it depends on a particular moment. So, you know, we're in this kind of weird economic moment where I'd say over the last 10 years, not only in this country, but globally, you know, prices um, for materials and labor skyrocketed mm -hmm. because, you know, the world was going through a fairly robust, certainly um, unequal, unequal uh, economic um, boom, right? So China, uh, you know, India, the U.S., uh, Europe, you know, um, there was a you know an intense uh, period of of growth and costs I think tended to skyrocket. On the other hand, you know when there's a sort of a down cycle, uh, the reverse happens, and um, um, that's that's not so good for many reasons. But you know there's a kind of a a correction, and I think also the results. I would also say that what has to be figured into this is different technologies and different um, ways of assembling a building affect what's happening. And there may be ways in which um, we're also victims of cycles of whether materials are being too heavily used or not heavily used enough. So um, depends on the part of the country, the part of the world. We had, you know, we're working on this embassy in India and um, there's a very, very significant um, uh, significant amount of, of marble. And, mm -hmm. you know, in this country, marble is very expensive. In India, if you make the right choices, it can be very inexpensive. And um, there is a kind of reverse because of the kind of uh, significant population that needs to be kept um, uh, working and economically, I think, engaged, um, labor is relatively inexpensive. So to standardize building materials there, in some cases, 
goes against the grain of keeping um, craftsmen uh, mm. at work, which is you know incredibly important. There's a social agenda to it too. So I, I think if you look at India, it's a very different situation than it might be here in the U.S. or in Europe or you know even parts of China that for whom uh, you know uh, labor is very very expensive. So everything yeah. you do is to try to kind of standardize building materials to reduce the kind of amount of labor. In India, we found in some cases that wasn't the case. Interesting. Are, are most of your projects in the United States? Most of them are, yeah. yeah. We're doing a, uh, a project in Kathmandu um, for the Department of State and uh, the big embassy in um, New Delhi, uh, you know, capital of India. We, we did a project in Africa that um, hopefully will go ahead for the Aga Khan Foundation. Um, it was a kind of a, a university project, very interesting in Arusha, that um, you know was intended to kind of be a, a sort of an equalizer, um, a way of uh, bringing a college secondary education to a larger population that might not get it. Um, so that was uh, an interesting project that was outside of a kind of uh, typical US. How do you go about approaching to uh, start designing a project that is in a culture and in a continent that is not the one you're experienced in, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that there is some similarities between, let's say, a, a college that you design in the U.S. and the one that you might, you might design in Africa. But how do you kind of bridge the cultural gap that you might not have of that specific yeah. location? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 actually a really great question. And um, um, India, you know, for example, is, at least uh, in, in the cities, is a very sophisticated country um, as well. You know, so there's a kind of a globalization, for better or for worse, that has been um, set in place. Um, parts of Africa and Arusha, we I think were very lucky because the Aga Khan Foundation, which is a a nonprofit foundation um, had been doing a lot of research there, and they had some smaller schools that they had already in place in uh, parts of Tanzania and Kenya. And um, so there was a kind of a, uh, we were very much helped by um, advisors who were deeply um, embedded in. Um, what it means to um, be educators in Africa. They were Africans. They were, you know, right. from Kenya. They were from Tanzania. Um, so in a way, we were we were guided by um, a very deep knowledge base because it would be very, I think you're, uh, this is spot on as a question. It's very easy to follow um, a kind of pattern that might be um, something that uh, you've done either here in the U.S., or if you're a Korean architect, something you've done in Seoul, and even though you adjust it for climate, there are uh, cultural differences that you might not be aware of. So we were very fortunate because we had a very engaged client who was very um, embedded in um, a kind of uh, local culture. And even in India, we're working with Indian architects, um, and um, we have... Uh, uh, architects in India now, uh, the project's going in construction. So, you know, there are cultural differences there too that one has to be very respectful of. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. A couple questions. Actually, we asked uh, Marianne this question. I'll ask you it too. Um, it's a test. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, we'll see how I answer it, right? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, your process in the studio, in your office, um, like what is the design process? Is there a discernible one? Um, how do you view that working as being consistent or inconsistent from project to project? Um, good good question. Um, it. it some of it depends. If if a project's, uh, let's say, a competition like our La Brea project um, or the Seattle project, then, you know, uh, we we kind of assemble a small team. Um, we spend as much time as we possibly can postponing a particular set of solutions and really immerse ourselves in the kind of question at hand. So in the for the La Brea project, it had to do with climate change, with the Pleistocene, 
with this very surreal idea of the La Brea Tar Pits in the middle of one of the sort of most active parts of the city, Wilshire Boulevard in LA, which is, you know, a city all about the future. So we were really trying to kind of talk about the fantasy of the future and the lessons of the past. Um, and, you know, talk to artists, talk to scientists, talk to paleontologists, and really try to postpone decisions. And then we started to make lots of models and we used, you know, digital models, analog models, and kind of tested ideas about how both the architecture of the museum could be expanded and how the, in a way that the subsurface architecture of the site might become uh, celebrated in our design. We made a lot of bad, <laughs> bad <laughs> models, bad designs. And then this whole idea of a, of a triple loop that would stitch both the site and the new building and the existing building together kind of emerged as the most important sort of um, figure. Um, it became the kind of DNA of the project, not only physically because it kind of made a very generous set of loops, but also metaphorically because it tied in research that was being done on the site with how information is conveyed in a museum. So that was a case of, getting back to your question, of a small group of us um, working intensely for you know a month and a half, mm. producing drawings, producing a film, and that you know then launching that as a project. Um, and fortunately, we won. So now we're kind of going through a more uh, slower, methodical project mm. um, with them and more methodical process mm. on a on a project where we respond to, let's say, a uh, request for qualifications or were invited to interview along with four other architects, we always try to put a few ideas out in the context of the interview, not only to sort of explain how we work, but also to gauge uh, and enter into a conversation with a potential client. Um, and if we do get the project, it's usually because they like the sort of iterative process that we've revealed in our interview. So they're comfortable with that. And then, you know, we do start a very iterative process where we test ideas out, even if they're very embryonic, um, to kind of get a conversation going. Mm -hmm. And we try to postpone a very specific conclusion until you know, um, we really feel like the, the the sort of 10, 15 different options, which then get down, narrow down to three, and then the two, there's a sort of, until we've had to explore it at a Darwinian level almost, do we feel kind of comfortable? And at that point, you know, the process might be pretty long. There are, you know, structural engineers, consultants who weigh in. And, you know, usually we have, I think, had a history of, of reviewing a particular design with a client, so they feel like it's it's their process too. And I think we try to engage uh, potential clients in our process as much as we can. With a competition, you're kind of free to be mm -hmm. completely focused, and then of course, you know, you send drawings in or present them one at one moment. But on other projects, we try to be much more iterative, and then. Uh, of course, we start with a small team, and that small team stays on a project all the way through and then grows as as needed. That's interesting. There's a couple ideas in there that I really like. The first was um, this notion of postponing decisions, um, which is, I think, is interesting, and I think it makes sense. And, and I, you mentioned also that related to that is um, the focusing more on the questions and postponing answers, not jumping to the answers. Um, but mm -hmm. it's funny because this, the idea of postponing decisions seems like antithetical to making progress in a way. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a terrifying moment, of course, where you postpone and postpone. Um, and then, then you have to sort of jump in and sometimes you kind of go, oh shit, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta you know, um, take these three models and figure out, you know, which is the best and, and you've got to do it this weekend. And that's when uh, both uh, fantastic things usually happen. And 
um, and you're both terrified and exhilarated at the same time. But yeah, I think, you know, and this I think is important uh, to press upon as an issue because I think, again, the kinds of projects we usually uh, find stimulating are also projects that don't have a very clear architectural definition. Um, mm. You know, it's it's not like a single family house that, you know, here's the client, here's what needs to happen. Usually there are projects that are sort of hybrid. It might be a lab, but also we think it could have a very important um, public space. Like our, our project at the University of Pennsylvania, the nanotechnology building was, was a lab, which typically labs are kind of, there's sort of formulas, you know, that you can do. But right. what we did is we postponed some decisions and realized that the thing that was amazing about the University of Pennsylvania where this lab is situated is that there are a series of quads. And that, in a way, makes the buildings that surround the quads, um, makes them feel like they're part of a kind of uh, a true campus. And I mean, this sounds like a cliche, but it's true. The open space actually um, in, in the best parts of that campus drives the sort of architectural set of relationships. So we, hmm. we started by saying if we push the lab back and created, uh, f- back from the edge of the street and created a truly urban open space, um, that might produce not only a good lab, but also a viable open space for a part of the campus that didn't have public open spaces. Um, the university liked that idea because we kind of tested it out in in a kind of a couple embryonic ways. They, they liked that because I think it also demonstrated that they could be good citizens in the city of Philadelphia, could create valuable open space. But also we found out that the scientists are doing all this incredible nano research. And for them, it was imperative that they be able to take a break and go outside and then go back in into the intensity of their lab. So for them, a little bit of open space was all about health. It was all about rejuvenating. Um, It was all about, you know, engaging other scientists in uh, small conversations and being able to do that outside of the lab. So that was a case of this kind of little thought we had when we were pushing ideas around. And it turned out that it not only solved and created a very interesting architectural um, uh, project where both open space and building were kind of in dialogue with each other, but it satisfied, I think, the, the scientists primary objection, uh, objective or, or objection actually of being stuck in a lab all day <laughs> without the ability to kind of get out and talk. Yeah. Yeah. The other part of the process you mentioned was uh, having an iterative process as it you know relates to, to the design process internally in the office, but also what it means for the client and architect relationship for them to go along this journey. Um, and I think that's interesting because I've I've been in offices where, when we have a client presentation, uh, it, it has to be very polished. It has to look like the final thing, even though we're only three weeks in, because we only show I'm the architect. We only show really really polished things, um, and that's one way to do it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, it seems like what you're describing is a little bit different, though. Is there ever concern uh, that if you show a client? an idea or design, a sketch, or I don't know, whatever it is, that is a bit undercooked, that, and they like it, that you might end up going down a path that is not, is not good? Do you know what I mean, kind of? Yeah. Because it's not been developed yeah. yet? Like, how does that yeah. work? Yeah. Well, I, we're, we're definitely in the camp of making sure that presentations don't look so polished. Um, and I, I think, you know, Mary and I draw by hand. We're always trying to introduce ha- some hand drawing into the presentation to kind of take a little bit of the curse that often, you know, highly rendered presentations have, which is they look prematurely finished. Mm. And um, we'll even bring little study models, anything we can do to kind of slow the process down. And we're not, you know, I mean, we, We'll certainly develop uh, 
parallel sophisticated um, renderings and animations, but we're also always wanting to kind of toggle between saying, look, this may look really finished, but you know, you can see in this little sketch, the sort of idea is still evolving. So we're always trying to kind of put the brakes on making the assumption too early on that we're, um, we're kind of finished with something. And I think that in a way, maybe, maybe it doesn't work with some clients, but often the clients who do choose us are aware of that mm -hmm. and are willing to, I think, suspend premature decision-making in favor of trying to find the right, right approach. And I think for us, it's also not trying to be slick, not trying to look <laughs> so professional that everything's done. And, you know, sometimes architects are so worried about what their clients are going to think that they perhaps don't give their clients enough credit for, um, enjoying the kind of uncertainty of an architectural process and, and being able to kind of appreciate that. That's a great point because I do think there are a lot of clients, if they've bothered to hire a, a legitimate architect for design reasons, they're interested in it most of the time. They want to learn yeah. about it, you know? Mm -hmm. It's almost a vicarious kind of thing. Uh, they want to feel it. Um, yep. So I know we're coming up on the 10.30, uh, well, 12.30 mark, whatever it is. Uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show and hearing your perspective and your stories and everything. It's been great. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think um, Marion was very, very excited. And I think what was really nice, um, even yesterday, I was just thinking about the kinds of questions and also thinking about, you know, the why, uh, <laughs> the what, and the how. Um <laughs> in a way that, uh, you know, typically you don't have an opportunity to think deeply about that. And so I thank you guys for um, some very good questions and tough questions, but also just uh, a chance to reflect on the work, uh, the trajectory of the work. Um, and then, uh, you know, we can speculate about uh, what's next and, and where we want to go. But I think this conversation has been fantastic. And uh, Time really flew. My gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Dear listener, thank you for tuning in to this episode. If you like what we're doing, if you liked this episode, then show your support by leaving us a review in the Apple Podcast app. That's probably the best way to support our show. Or you can mail us a check <laughs> for $1 million. $1 million. Uh, you can also find us on Spotify and YouTube. Subscribe on both of those places. Pretty much all of the interviews and um, the more helpful episodes that are guides are on YouTube as well. Um, you can reach out to us on all the social medias. Now, why would a person follow us on Instagram, Marina? Because you follow other people, so why not follow us? <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, we have quotes, like you said, right? We, we have, have quotes. Video we, clips. We have video clips. See. We have uh, carousels of our guests and their work. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't know them, that might you know excite you to listen or watch their episode. Mm -hmm. uh, we post updates if there is an event or anything happening exciting with the show. We would be on there, and also sometimes we just have listeners who just want to reach out to us directly, and you know, like DM and like direct messages is the mm -hmm. way to get in touch with us if you want to. Yes, DM. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter, um, so you can find us on there as well. We have a hotline, which is 213-222-6950. It has been a very successful hotline. People text and call, and they leave voicemails and messages, and we respond on the podcast and give advice. For free. You know, love advice, <laughs> advice regarding hairstyles, whatever you want. It's, oh, it's, okay. it's here. Um, anything else? That's it for now. Nope. Just thanks again for listening. It means a lot. And... Uh, Talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye. And leave us a review. Bye-bye.